T minus one minute. Engine start box go. 45. Sitting on top of that rocket is the craft that will take astronauts to Mars. For the first time, humanity will expand to another planet. Five, four, three, two, one. We are on the path to Mars. That's what's exciting. This is the first time humans will have been on another planet. Going to Mars is the most exciting thing that will happen in the 21st century. And liftoff. So you'll see new technologies develop, new economies emerge, and really, a new generation of space explorers will be defined through this process. This is the first test flight of the Orion spacecraft, which replaces the shuttles. It went into orbit around the Earth. Well, it was a great day for Orion. The mission itself was a two-orbit mission. The second orbit projected up to 3,600 miles, the highest a human spacecraft has gone since Apollo 17 in 1972. Service panel and if you're excited by all this Mars talk, there's good news. These days, NASA's not the only game in town. Private company Mars One has already advertised for astronauts to go to the red planet and never come back. Would anyone sign up for that? Well, uh, apparently so. We had more than 200,000 applications from people who said, I want to be on your first team. Here's just a selection. No astronaut experience necessary. I am not a scientist. My name is M1K0. I was born 100,100 years ago on Mars. The time for mankind to live on Mars is now. I want to go to Mars because it's the ultimate experience of a lifetime. I want to achieve the best. I want to do amazing things. 24 PhD student in astrophysics. Let's go to Mars. Mars One says, unlike NASA, they're going to use private money to get people to Mars. They also say they're going to get people there much sooner. In fact, 2027 is the date they're talking about at the moment. But the key difference is they'll do it much more cheaply, primarily because they're not bringing the astronauts back. The short list of one-way astronauts is now down to 100, and Melbournean Diane McGrath is on it. I was born the day before Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon. Her drive to go to Mars is to offer humanity a fresh start. It's a chance to say, can we really show that we can survive on 100% renewable energy? What about our waste management systems? We can't just dig a big hole in the back of Mars and dump our waste there. So I love the idea of, can we on another planet work out a way to manage our resources in such a way that we preserve the planet? But what about the one-way aspect of it? Yeah, yeah. You're heading off and not coming back. Yeah, and, and maybe that's part of the adventure that I like in life. There are people out there that think, you're crazy, why don't you do this? I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that think that. <laughs> oh, undoubtedly. Uh, and then I guess they get to meet me and then understand some of the, the motivations behind it about inspiring our youth of today. Inspiring a new generation is one thing, but Mars One's plans do sound very ambitious, perhaps a little crazy even. There's always been people that wanted to go to new places, the frontier. For example, in 1900, if someone migrated to Australia, he probably had friends and family that said, are you crazy? The education system, the housing, the, the medical care in Australia is not as good as, as it is in Europe back in 1900. And you're going there, why are you going? But a one-way ticket to Mars. We asked a leading space engineer what he thought of Mars One's plans. I think sending people to Mars is an interesting thing to be thinking about. I think it's entirely possible to, to adapt to living on Mars. We need projects like Mars One in order to uh, start this conversation. Even NASA wasn't dismissive. NASA, as a major initiative, we're very much encouraging the participation of private commercial enterprises in the exploration of space. NASA, of course, are the only ones with a significant Mars budget at the moment, though. And this is the official Orion mock-up, used for design and astronaut training. There are two seats in it at the moment. Eventually, there'll be four. But most noticeably, its shape is just a pod. Compare that to the Space Shuttle, with its wings and almost aeroplane-like appearance. The reason for the difference is, unlike the Shuttle, Orion will go into deep space, not just low Earth orbit 
and so will travel at much greater speeds. A typical velocity in, in low Earth orbit is something around 17,500 miles per hour. To leave Earth orbit, we have to be up closer to 25 to 30,000 miles per hour. In those cases, you never take wings. You can't support the structures for that sort of thing. A new launch rocket also has to be developed to get Orion to those high speeds. It's a much faster regime requiring a lot of energy to get out of what we call the gravity well of, of Earth or any other large planetary body. And I'm guessing the new launch rocket was named by the engineers. It's called the Space Launch System. And what it may lack in a name actually is way made up for in power. It is going to be the largest rocket that we've ever employed to human spaceflight. But there are still big technological challenges getting astronauts to Mars. Incredibly, we still don't even know how to land them on the red planet, despite having landed a lot of robotic craft there, starting with the Viking spacecraft in the 1970s. Now, NASA's come up with some innovative landing methods over the years. But weight is the key. This technique only worked because the Pathfinder rover inside was just a couple of hundred kilograms. To get the massive, almost one tonne Curiosity down, the biggest rover ever landed, required a radically new method. Catalyst was at NASA for the landing in 2012, and stress levels were sky high because the new landing technique required a lot of things to go right. We've got about 15 minutes to touch down and the tension's really building. The spacecraft hits Mars's upper atmosphere at 21,000 kilometres an hour. It's first slowed by friction, protected by a heat shield. Next, a parachute's released. Then the retro rockets kick in. And finally, nylon cables lower the Curiosity to the surface. Touchdown confirmed. Receive fire. They pulled it off. That was an incredibly difficult landing. Time to see where our curiosity will take us. But even this risky method wouldn't work for getting humans down on Mars. Because their craft will be much heavier than even Curiosity. Here's the thing. For heavier craft, the atmosphere on Mars is too thin for parachutes to work. There just wouldn't be the time to slow the craft down. So, use retro rockets, you might say, like we did landing on the moon. Well, the trouble there is, unlike the moon, there is some atmosphere on Mars, and that causes turbulence in the retro rockets. Absolutely, it is a major challenge. And you'll see some market differences between what we did on the Curiosity lander or the Pathfinder landers before that, that the robotics were able to take some forces and things that the crew will not. So you'll, you'll see some major differences. Some form of retro rockets will be used, but it won't be plain sailing. Obviously, it's the type of technology and function that we have addressed in the past, such as the lunar landers that we had earlier. If the mission and landing are successful and the astronauts set foot on Mars, life will certainly be challenging. It appears like the Australian desert here, apart from the blue sunsets, but looks are deceiving. Temperatures are mostly below freezing. The atmosphere is so thin, your skin and organs would rupture without a spacesuit. And this place is continually bombarded by deadly radiation. The radiation is a real issue. The Curiosity rover recently measured it meticulously. It's in the form of tiny high-speed particles raining down from space. And spacesuits won't protect against it. One source of them is, well, chunks of the sun that are regularly belched into space. These are clouds of cancer-causing high-energy particles, which luckily are deflected from Earth by our planet's magnetic field. The beautiful aurorae are side effects of the process. But Mars has no protective magnetic field. When the sun belches a coronal mass ejection, as they're called, the astronauts will cop the full brunt. I caught up with the head of Mars One, visiting Melbourne, to find out about his plans for coping with the sun's ravages. It's never going to be a lethal dose. It's always going to be an increased risk. 
uh, for example, for developing a tumor because of the radiation, which is why we will protect our people inside the habitat with a layer of soil, a layer of sand on top of the habitat. So inside the habitat, they will be protected just about as well as we are here on Earth. A warning system for when the sun lets loose will have to be set up. We have them here. On Earth already, we know when a big solar flare is coming, uh, and we, we have about 30 minutes of warning ahead of that. Here, when the warning comes, we lower the power in our electricity grids. On Mars, the astronauts will drop what they're doing and head straight indoors. But there's more. Who would have thought that distant black holes and exploding stars would pose a risk too? They eject high-speed, cancer-causing particles to all corners of the galaxy, including Mars. To lower the risk from this continual rain of particles, Bass says two hours a day outside the habitat would be a maximum. People say, oh, they, they can only go outside two hours per day. But I think the average person in Australia probably doesn't get two hours per day outside. And a lot of people are in their office, they walk to their car, one minute outside, they drive home, they walk to their front door, 10 minutes outside, and that's it. For Diane, leaving family, friends, and a partner behind will be the tough part. Although she says they're all very supportive. We have a 10-year window, uh, 10 years when we can be physically in each other's lives. But then after that, you know, that, that physical aspect of being in a relationship is only a part of it. People have had distance relationships before. This would just be a very long distance relationship. After all, communication with the Mars base will still be possible. It just won't involve live chat because the laws of physics mean there'll always be a delay on any internet connection. Imagine clicking your Google search on Mars and waiting for the signal to reach the Google server in San Francisco, which is 20 minutes and then you wait for 20 minutes for your first 10 hits, then you click a hit and the same thing happens again. My internet provider is not much better than that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and there are plenty of other challenges and risks getting to Mars. We have to work out how to farm food there, avoid the toxic Martian dust, which is very high in thyroid damaging chemicals, and some, who've perhaps read a bit too much science fiction, even worry about catching Mars viruses. I think the odds are very slim. Uh, we don't know if there's life on Mars at this moment. So finding life, first of all, would be extremely exciting. The good news is we found life on Mars. The bad news is it's going to kill you. One thing the astronauts will have to do is exploit the Martian resources, particularly the frozen water underground. So surveying the planet in detail will be paramount. Andrew Dempster's team is helping to develop new kinds of satellites for space surveying. They're called CubeSats. A regular satellite is about the size of a small car, but this new generation of CubeSats is that big. And they've still got all the key equipment, that's GPS, the orbit control, the power supply communications, but all packed into a volume the size of two litres of milk. Five test CubeSats were recently released from the International Space Station. Eventually, swarms of them will carry out space surveys of everything from asteroids to planets like Mars. A big, bold space future awaits us. But is our Martian dreaming really just an astronomical waste of money? Why not just say we've got enough problems here on Earth, we don't need to go to Mars? Politicians say, well, every dollar spent on Apollo gave us $14 in return uh, in economic value, but I think that the most valuable thing that came from the Apollo missions were actually the pictures and the words and the stories and the videos. That's inspiration and that's how kids get interested in pursuing a science career. That's how people get inspired to think big and to pursue their dreams. Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting point, I think, of how many scientists were inspired by the Apollo landings. I wag school for the day, basically, so I could watch it happen. That's one small step for man. But Mars One has some very high hurdles to jump. For a start, there's still to raise the money from private investors. And their goal of a 2027 landing seems optimistic. Mars One, as it's currently designed, will not succeed. But, you know, it's a starting point. And there's no reason why, with a bit more work, it 
wouldn't be feasible. In marketing, we usually say, you set your goal in stone, but your plan in sand. And for Diane, the goal is very definitely set in redstone. There's something about the dreams we have as kids that we start to take on this yoke of responsibility as we grow up, and mortgages, and houses, and families, and why do we stop dreaming? I don't think we have to stop dreaming.